One of the really um, delightful things about Leonardo da Vinci uh, is comparable to one of the really delightful things uh, in my tenure at the Aspen Institute, which is the connection of music to everything that we do, we do. And part of that connection comes from the fact that Alan Fletcher not only runs the world's most magical music festival and school, but he's an absolute delight to have as a partner. Uh, everything we do together seems to become more magical. And I think of uh, Leonardo traveling to Milan with a great musician, Atalante, of whom Leonardo made a sketch and later a painting, I think, with his face held high in the sun, carrying a lira de braca, a sort of arm fiddle, and going to Milan as a musician, but uh, then becoming part of the intellectual life there. The same can be said of Alan Fletcher, who's a great composer, but more importantly, a great person and a great friend. Alan Fletcher. Nice. Well, shucks. Uh, that was super nice, and now I'm scared. Um, normally, when I begin uh, speaking about music, uh, because music is all about timing, I know exactly how long I'm going to uh, speak. And actually, uh, the subject of Leonardo and, and sort of very diverse uh, things that it brings up to me uh, means I have no idea whether I have three hours prepared or possibly 17 minutes. Um, if it's three hours, uh, you'll just have to deal with that. Um, but uh, it, it is certainly correct that um, Leonardo had a tremendous love for music and that music was uh, extremely important to him. Um, when he came down from Vinci uh, and, and to be apprenticed to Verrocchio, uh, music was one of the standard curricula in the studio of Verrocchio. All, all of the apprentices uh, studied music. And um, I certainly like to link this to something that, that my very distinguished uh, fellow presenters have been saying over the past two days. And that is that um, there was no sense of division among these areas of study. There was instead a conviction that they all supported each other and were all important to each other. And uh, although there was such a thing as a specialist in music, as we will find out in the next uh, 17 minutes, um, uh, the, the idea that Leonardo would be at once uh, a, a painter and an architect, an engineer, a scientist, and a musician um, was uh, not a strange idea. Um, so jumping ahead a little in his life, Luca Pacioli, the, uh, the great mathematician uh, whom he would encounter in uh, Milan, uh, said of Leonardo, he was a denissimo pittore prospectivo architecto musico. So the four things that occur to Pacioli to say about Leonardo is that he's a painter, a designer, an architect, and a musician. Um, Going even further in time, Vasari uh, felt confident enough to say that Leonardo sang divinely, although Vasari was writing uh, long after his death and never heard him. But he was, he was pretty sure. Um, and, and, and not to make a joke of it, he was sure because it's something that almost everybody who knew Leonardo said about him. Uh, what a wonderful musician he was. Now, uh, some of our fellow presenters have already let you know that Leonardo felt there was a, a malatia in music, a, a, a fault, uh, which is that it just disappears and, and other forms of art remain. And uh, yet, he was fascinated with it and his notebooks throughout his life have inquiries into acoustics, into the properties of musical instruments, into how to make musical instruments better so that the sound wouldn't just dissipate and, and be gone. And yet, Leonardo leaves us uh, this beautiful phrase about music, that it's the figurazione delle cose invisibili, the shaping. Music is the shaping of the invisible. Uh, I think especially a pointed and poignant phrase coming from a great uh, visual artist. Uh, also in his Paragone, he says that music, he ranks music highest among the arts after painting. 
Um, so, the, 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 sort of the genesis of my whole uh, remarks here uh, is a seminar that was given uh, by the Friends of Florence a couple of years ago here. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Ross King was there, Bill Cook was there, um, and I was sitting in the back. Uh, the Edelmans were, were moderating. And uh, one of the presenters made a comment about Leonardo having been a musician, and in fact, uh, it appears that he made a, quite a good living uh, as an itinerant uh, performer, both in Florence and then when he went to Milano. So um, someone said, what would that music have sounded like? Does anyone know? And uh, I said, well, <laughs> I, I have some ideas about it. Um, and, and so when, when Walter was planning this, uh, we, we thought it might be nice to have a few moments of thinking about the music of Leonardo's time. So when he came down to, to Florence, um, Florence was one of the great musical capitals uh, of Europe. And I'd like to uh, go back in time a little bit. Um, to the uh, consecration of the Duomo in Florence in, uh, I believe, 1421. Um, and the master of music uh, for the new cathedral was Guillaume Dufay, uh, who was a Flemish uh, composer and one of the uh, most uh, esteemed uh, composers in Europe. Um, there was a mobility among musicians, and the Flemish school was considered to be the pinnacle uh, of, of excellence, and so every, every court and every uh, you know, great religious organization wanted a Flemish uh, composer. Uh, I'm not super expert on the boundaries uh, of how people define themselves, but Dufay, I think, would have defined himself as Flemish, uh, whereas uh, Josquin, to whom we will come in a few minutes, uh, who uh, grew up only a few miles away uh, from where Dufay was, uh, was being trained himself, uh, Josquin was French uh, from Picardy. So uh, I think my cards are not in order. Um, <laughs> Dufay. Uh, so, and Dufay lived uh, into Leonardo's lifetime. It, it is uh, perfectly possible that they would have met. Uh, he was the master of music at the Duomo, and he wrote uh, this really, really remarkable piece. Uh, for the consecration of the Duomo, uh, because we're going to end up talking about proportion and uh, geometry, uh, if you will, in music. Uh, I will just uh, give you a few examples of this piece. And uh, did we, Katie, did we get the? Oh, great. OK. Um, we're we're going to hear the piece in a moment. Um, it's, it's a motet. and. It's on a psalm text uh, about flowers, uh, in, in essence, because the, the church was called Santa Maria dei Fiori. And um, it has uh, the proportions. It's in four sections, um, each with seven times seven times four uh, sections within. Uh, the point of this uh, is many points, but the, the mystical number of the Virgin is seven and the, the church is to be consecrated to, uh, to the Virgin. And um, so there's 28 sections, then 14 sections, then seven, then seven, so a diminution. Um, the, I really want my card on this. Here it is. Uh, the, the text is made up, each line is made up of seven syllables in honor of the Virgin. The number of beats is, is changed throughout the piece into proportions of 6, 4, 3, and 2. And these are the Pythagorean proportions. Uh, Pythagoras observed that the overtone series uh, goes in these proportions 2, 3, 4, 6. Um, and the tuning of the instruments is in 2, 3, 4, 6, which we'll get to in a second as well. Um, then if you go back to Second Kings, uh, you see that Solomon designed the original temple uh, with a length of three score cubits, 60, uh, a height of 30 cubits, a width of 20, and the distance of 40 cubits from the front door to the Holy of Holies. So the, the Temple of Solomon was to be in the Pythagorean uh, proportions as well. Um, and thus, there's a, a mystical linking in this piece of music 
uh, of the proportions of the temple, the new cathedral, the mystical number of the virgin, um, et cetera. The feast of dedication of Solomon's temple was seven plus seven days. And those are proportions that are uh, throughout this music. So now we'll just hear a little bit about uh, of this. It's uh, Nupe Rosarum Flores, uh, motet by Guillaume Dufay, written for the opening of the cathedral in Florence. So um, what you're hearing there is polyphony, and, and polyphony was the, the newish thing. And, and the, the older Italian uh, church music and, and, and music by Italian composers was more homophonic, meaning everyone does the same thing at the same time. And the Flemish composers uh, and the Notre Dame school had created this idea of flowing lines that are, that are sort of set like translucent glazes over each, each other. Uh, and creating a tremendous sense of depth and shape. Uh, but also, uh, polyphony has a, a much uh, clarity of declamation in terms of the text. The text flows in, in a much uh, uh, clearer way than in the older homophonic music. I think I'll say more about that in a minute. Let's look at the Lira da Braccia. Okay, so. Uh, also, you've heard over and over again uh, that when Leonardo came down, uh, the, his instrument was this, uh, lira da braccia, meaning uh, hand lyre, if you will, braccio arm, um, and as opposed to, let's go to the next one, viola da gamba. Uh, this is the other common stringed instrument. This is a precursor to the cello, uh, viola da gamba, meaning, uh, you know, use your leg. To, to hold it again, and now we'll go backwards. And the lira da braccia, because you, you balance it on your arm. Um, this is a precursor of the viola or violin, except it's a little different. If you look closely at it, uh, it has five strings, um, where the violin has four. And the extra string is a lower string tuned the same as, as the, the low string. And then there are two strings that are stuck off to the side uh, where you would not be able to stop them. You wouldn't be able to change their pitch, but they would be a drone. And um, Leonardo himself describes various schemes for how to tune these, but, but typically they would have been also lower octaves uh, drones. Now let's skip ahead two. And here is uh, the, from the London uh, Virgin of the Rocks, the left thing. Um, who is it, Predis, who, who, who actually painted this? Francesco Napolitano, probably. Yeah, OK, Napolitano. Uh, in any case, um, here this angel is playing the lira de braccio. And you see uh, he or she is holding it sort of upright um, in what looks to be a very uncomfortable way. <laughs> uh, let's go on to another, because uh, this is more the way uh, people think they were played, and much more like a viola or violin. And, um, and it's, it's bowed, as you see. OK, let's go on to the next one. OK, that's just scan. So um, I think that's going to be all I will say about the instrument. Uh, also, very picturesque detail is that when uh, Lorenzo uh, sent Leonardo to Milano to, to Lodovico Sforza, um, he appears to have been a sort of musical emissary. He was to sing for him and perform for him. 
um, and he also took with him the gift of a lira da braccio, but it was made mostly of silver uh, in the shape of a horse's skull. So very fanciful and, and also something uh, true of Leonardo throughout his life. He loved the grotesque um, and uh, basically loved skulls anyway. Um, so he comes down from Vinci to Florence, uh, and there he would have encountered Josquin. And Josquin is, is going to be the, the subject of the center of my remarks here, uh, because uh, one of the most interesting figures in the history of music. Um, the, the person Josquin is most often mentioned with is Beethoven. And then when people write about Beethoven and the cult of the hero in music, they say the only comparable person really in the history of Western music is Josquin. So um, I could go on and on about whether that is apt or not to compare them. The things they had in common uh, were they both came to be regarded as absolutely the greatest living composer during their lifetime, uh, to a degree unlike almost anyone else. Uh, a key fact, because Stefan was asking about this uh, on Monday, uh, a key fact in the fame of Josquin is that the first ever publication of music uh, was of his music, and the first ever volume devoted uh, to a single composer was to Josquin. And so all of a sudden, uh, the fame of this composer could, uh, not only the fame, but the actual music uh, could travel to all of the courts uh, and churches uh, in Europe. Um, that first book of music, by the way, is by Petrucci, and, and we still call the music font that, that we all use Petrucci to this day. Uh, he was in Venice, uh, and, and that first publication was in 1501, and after 1501, they, they followed Fast and Furious. Petrucci actually published three entire collections of masses uh, just by Joss Kane. Um, one uh, Beethoven scholar uh, that I like uh, writes about Josquin that he had the first musical brand name. And um, this is because uh, very few composers were known by name uh, before his time. There, there are a handful. Um, but so many pieces were attributed to Josquin during his lifetime because of the prestige of his name um, that uh, it, it's one of those attribution problems to this day uh, to study. Um, but um, Martin Luther, of all people, uh, made the observation and said, now that Josquin is dead, there is so much more of his music being written. <laughs> and in fact, since I'm talking about Martin Luther, uh, he made this comment as well. Josquin is the master of the notes. They must do as he wills. As for other composers, they have to do as the notes will. Um, so uh, the thing about Josquin's music is, uh, I've already mentioned some of these uh, qualities, lucidity of texture, uh, form always based on text, and clarity of declamation. And you'll observe these are humanistic or Renaissance values. Um, it is interesting, just as a side uh, a, a detour, the idea that Josquin had completely transcended his uh, forebears in music, uh, his teachers, Dufay and Nakagam, um, is, is based on uh, something that, that some of our other presenters have been observing. It, it's, it's a fallacy that art improves and, and that one is better than the people who came before because, uh, because they came before. Um, Dante has a very pointed remark uh, about uh, Cimabue and Giotto and the, the nature of fame in art, and that now Giotto is considered better than Cimabue, but more or less saying to us, as if. Um, and yet, Josquin is one of those moments, uh, as, as Beethoven was, uh, when everyone just agrees, this is better than everything that came before, and now this is the new uh, foundation uh, for where music will go, and indeed, he is considered uh, to be the beginning of, of the great renaissance in music as so often happens in the history of the arts, uh, music is, is the latest, the last to get it. Um, now, here's a paradox, because uh, we've heard that the idea of rulemaking 
was so important to Leonardo and to his time, and that, that we should find out the rules that govern uh, the arts. Um, and yet it was observed of Chasquin in his time that he was constantly breaking the rules and that uh, there had been a fairly agreed upon uh, basis uh, for how good music should be written. And, uh, and the study of music was, was split into theory and practice. Um, Josquin and some others proposed that the study of music should be theory, practice, <coughs> and poetry, um, a linking of the arts in a way. Uh, but uh, a great writer about Josquin observes, uh, his music cannot be defined by rules, but rather requires natural instinct, even grace. And thus, you could say that Josquin was the first musician uh, to be considered a genius in this uh, sort of troubling sense. The idea of genius being pre-Christian, uh, an idea recovered from the ancients, hence, uh, by definition, a Renaissance idea. And Josquin is the first composer to be considered a born composer in this sense. So a few things about him. Um, he uh, was born in 1451 in Picardy, uh, near the cathedral town of Cambrai. Um, he came to Italy. Uh, the first known appearance is in 1484 in Milan, where he was with Ascanio Sforza. Uh, in 1489, he was called to Rome, uh, which was the most prestigious post. Uh, but in 1502, uh, he applied to be the master of music in Ferrara, at the court of er Ercole d'Este. Um, and Ferrara, er Ercole d'Este was creating one of those great centers for culture uh, in order uh, to enhance his own prestige, and uh, decided he needed a court composer. And they interviewed uh, Josquin and his close friend and sort of schoolmate, uh, Henrik Isaac. Um, it's interesting that the advisors to, to uh, the Duke in Ferrara said, um, in the end, you should take Isaac and not Josquin. Uh, Isaac is more sociable and composes more quickly. Josquin is clearly the better composer, but he only composes when he pleases. <laughs> and furthermore, he wants 200 ducats and Isaac only wants 120. <laughs> um, but the composing only when he pleases is a key factor. And throughout Josquin's career, uh, he has a very assertive nature uh, and he, uh, like Haydn, uh, later, a few hundred years later, uh, he often gently makes fun of his patrons. Um, for instance, uh, he was, I, I'm jumping ahead here, he was uh, at the court of Louis XII in, in France. And Louis XII um, understood that he was a really bad singer, but he wanted to sing. And so he asked Josquin to write him something that would be suitable for the king to join in. And Josquin came up with a piece in which there are three parts. One of the parts has only one pitch. <laughs> and it just goes the same pitch over and over and over again. And the other parts do all this stuff around it. And evidently, the king was delighted. Um, but uh, he did get the job in Ferrara um, and uh, wrote one of his most famous works, uh, which now we're going to hear. Um, in honor of Ercole d'Este. And he took the syllables, uh, I'm not going to explain how this works, but he had the idea of taking the syllables of the Duke's name, converting them into pitches by an algorithm, and, and making the entire piece be based on the name of, of the Duke. Um, OK, let's hear some of that. This is the Hosanna.
I, th I think maybe you hear, although it's, they're very close in time, the Dufay, oh, we'll stop here. Uh, and this, it's, it's much more complex and yet transparent. And, and the, the polyphony has more voices and, and more stuff happening in it, and yet it has absolute clarity uh, of style and, and to me, much more motion. And you think of all those Leonardo drawings of the motion of air and the motion of water. Um, make sure I come back in, in a moment to Leonardo's analogies. Uh, of course, so much of his thinking is based on analogy. Uh, something is like something uh, or the same, uh, governed by the same principles. And Leonardo observed uh, that the best way to visual, well, to visualize, the best way to think about sound waves was to think about water waves. And you could study them uh, in a more interesting way that way. Um, I just wanted to read this quote uh, from a, a scholar of Josquin and Ferrara. Um, and the, the, the significance of the Duke realizing that he needs a great musician at his court, saying the musician of great reputation could now confer upon a patron the same measure of reflected glory that had traditionally been attributed only to poets and painters. Um, okay. Now, uh, I'm, I'm tracing a funny uh, idea, uh, which is that Leonardo comes down to Florence, Josquin is there. Josquin goes to Milan, Leonardo goes to Milan. They both go to Rome at about the same time. They're both in some way associated with Louis XII uh, in, in France for a while. They're both in Ferrara. Um, Josquin is the master of music. Uh, Leonardo has, it, has his sort of excursion there uh, to explore commissions, which I think don't turn out right. Um, they both had a relation with Isabella d'Este in, in Mantua. And um, I'm gonna read you a fun quote from her. Uh, here she is writing ordering a clavichord uh, from Lorenzo Gusnasco, uh, who uh, was from Pavia near Milano, but uh, had set up his shop in Venice and was considered one of the greatest instrument makers. Leonardo was a frequent visitor in Venice uh, with Gusnasco. And curiously, at one point, Gusnasco writes to Isabella d'Este saying, Leonardo has finished the magnificent portrait of you, <laughs> which however, I guess, this is not my area, but I guess we don't think that portrait ever happened. No. Anyway, uh, Isabella Deste says uh, to Gusnasco, he had made a clavichord for her sister, Beatrice Deste, uh, and she says, we want only to request that it should be played easily, that is, with a light hand, for we have such a light hand that we cannot play well if we have to strain our hand because of the resistance of the keys. Uh, these are issues that we still have today uh, with pianos. But it, it seems like a coincidence that a person renowned as the greatest musical genius of his time, and in fact the type of the musical genius, should have been in all these places uh, more or less at the same time as Leonardo. Um, there is as far as I can tell, absolutely no record of them ever meeting or even speaking about each other. Um, but they seem to have been so close. And what are the chances that a person of the curiosity and, and you know, omnivorous um, acquisitorial intelligence of Leonardo would have been following this person around without knowing him? Um, it's maybe worth uh, observing that Josquin had the same problems with the sodomy laws that Leonardo had. Um, and yet, I, I finally decided, because I can't prove anything about this, I finally decided it's more that these were the great courts. These, these were the great uh, figures in Milano, in Ferrara, who wanted to establish themselves as patrons of the arts. And thus, it's the reverse of what I'm suggesting. It's not that they were following each other around is that they were being attracted by the same people to the same places and for the same reason. Okay. Um, now we have some live music, which I think will be nice, uh, from Josquin. And uh, there will be a slide for this. Uh, 
Uh, see, I was going to show you the Duomo just while you listen to the Defy. Um, but here are two members of the Aspen Opera Center uh, who have uh, taken the time uh, to learn two short uh, segments of uh, two different masses by Josquin. So Dorothy and Sienna. As they sing, I just wish you to think, uh, think about Leonardo and that quote from Vasari that he sang divinely. Second. So I'd just like to sketch out a little uh, of uh, some of Leonardo's thinking about proportion in music, proportion in sound as analogous to proportion in a space and, and to visual proportion. And uh, it starts with what you heard in, in that, that duo, uh, because you have two voices singing essentially the same thing, so by analogy the same, and yet one of the singers has a voice which is proportionately deeper than the other. I'm not going to explain how and why, but human voices come in, in what are now called in German uh, Fach, uh, a, a sort of register quality type. And those types are actually proportional in a Pythagorean way, uh, in, in the natural human voice. And so what Jaskin is playing with there is how different it sounds to have a a voice whose natural overtones are lower and a voice whose natural overtones are higher. Um, and he's contrasting them in the same thing and then in different things. Uh, so he is enacting, in a way, 
uh, a golden section proportion uh, in terms of timbre, uh, but Josquin also was concerned with, with enacting golden sections in time. So uh, all of his pieces have proportions which are Pythagorean or, or golden section related uh, to each other in terms of where things happen in time, but also in space. Uh, the, the, the layout of the lines uh, is according to golden sections in, in space, so that there is what we now uh, would call a fractal uh, element in the design. The, the, it it is, permeates from the smallest scale to the largest scale of the, of the piece. And these are all things uh, that were preoccupations of Leonardo. I mentioned before, um, he was uh, concerned um, to demonstrate uh, how sound carries in space and to show that it is analogous to the way light is perceived in space. Um, so uh, again, it's just interesting to me that, that the things he describes in the notebooks as thought experiments, uh, Josquin is making into real music. Um, it's also something uh, one perhaps regrets is that there is not a single uh, bit of music by Leonardo that has come down to us. There are places in the notebooks where he is sketching things out in music <coughs> notation. He clearly understood music notation uh, as it was at the time. Um, but it appears that everything he did was an improvisation and was not recorded uh, by anyone. So uh, that is too bad. Uh, this might be a, a good place to pause for a second and see uh, if there's anything that you would like to amplify for me, that would be great. Uh, or if there's anything that I can uh, comment on. Ken? Yeah. One of the themes of the last few days was that Leonardo, in his inventions and gears and everything else, modeled after nature. In music at that time, was there a modeling after nature? Was there imitation of birds? Or was there an imitation of anything in the natural world? Uh, I don't get any birds. Um, I'm, I'm sort of torn because I, I, I feel as though uh, what defines uh, Renaissance music is a sense of um, making um, as opposed to imitation of nature. Um, at the same time, what I just was saying suggests that, that these composers were, were situating their music within the rules of the natural world in an extremely conscious way. Um, and this goes back to one of the great Leonardo themes, um, which is that everything is analogous, that the universe is, is one. And, and every thread that you pull, every thread of knowledge that you put your hand on is going to lead you into another area of, of knowledge because they're indivisible. And um, so that would make the music more a part of the natural world. Um, there was, you, you have these glorious spaces, uh, the Duomo in Florence um, as an example, and uh, there was a lot of research, if you will, by the composers into how to most effectively use the space so to time the music and to, and to give you know, space to the music so that it fills the room in the, in the most beautiful way. Uh, what was musical notation like at the time? And did composers own their music, or did other people play it? Hmm. Uh, the, the, the music notation looks pretty much like a staff that we have now, lines, except instead of five, there were four. Um, and you have little notes. But whereas we now have all the notes um, the same shape, more or less, they had square ones and round ones and triangular ones uh, to show different durations and, and what were called mensurations of, of sound. Uh, the notation, uh, that system of notation was fairly new. Uh, had been devised by Guido of Arezzo, Guido of Monaco. Um, and, uh, but as I say, Leonardo uses it uh, several times in, in, in the notebooks. Um, music was, as you hear in these examples, 
uh, a, a key thing that was not happening was a sense of modulation in music. Um, so uh, you, you had pretty much a simple set of notes uh, to work with, and that's what you were going to use. And, and, and the great subsequent revolution um, is, is the idea of, of modulation, which then required a more complex musical notation uh, than they had then. What was the second part of your question? So the question is whether composers own their music. Um, I, I think I would be anachronistic if I used the word copyright. Um, but uh, Petrucci was the one who was making money on his publications. I'm not aware that Josquin made any money um, from that. Uh, but it, it all fits together, the fact that his name became known all across Europe, made his name a form of currency, which he then eagerly exploited uh, himself. Um, and, and it's absolutely known. Uh, it's, it's another unique thing about Josquin is that even decades after his death, uh, his music was being reproduced and reperformed. And uh, sometimes people say anachronistically, again, um, that the idea of classical music stems from the time of Mendelssohn, that before that there was no idea of performing music from the past because it was so good. Uh, but that is not true because um, Shostakovich's music was being copied out and performed in Spain decades after he died. So. Yes. During the Renaissance, did Leonardo create an instrument? Yeah, Leonardo what created, he, he, he created play? many instruments, and I think we have some of them uh, around here. Uh, the Victoria and Albert show had them. Um, I don't think they're that great. Um, <laughs> as far as I know, none of them really caught on. Um, the, uh, right during his lifetime, uh, the modern violin and cello are becoming what they are now. And so the lira de braccio is, is a sort of a proto-violin. Um, but we're in, what, late 1500s, and the, the golden age of violin making is going to start uh, at the end of the 16th century and go into the beginning of the 17th century. Um, the, the clavichord existed, as you heard. Isabella d'Este wanted one just as good as Beatrice's was. Um, but um, they were pretty rudimentary. Uh, they, they have only about an octave and a fifth of, of keys as compared to harpsichords, which get much bigger. Um, the, uh, Leonardo talks a lot about the difference between instruments that make pitch and instruments that just make uh, percussive noises. And uh, that's, he experimented a lot with those, uh, trying to figure out how to make uh, better percussion instruments. Um, yeah, the trombone is becoming itself during this time, but would never have been used in music like this. It would have only been used in, in secular uh, dance music. Uh, way in the back. So was there a preference at the time to use voice instead of instruments because they weren't quite developed, or was there a taste for one or the other? No, the controversy on voice and instruments in sacred music um, is, is a theological one. And uh, there was the feeling that uh, I'm getting a little ahead in, in this because Palestrina is the great figure in this, and that's a generation uh, beyond us. But um, there was a feeling that, that the music in the Roman Catholic Church had become too ornate. Um, and, and a lot of Josquin's masses were available, were published, so that you could play them on instruments as well as sing them and just turn them into instrumental music. Um, uh, famously at the Council of Trent, um, this is partly apocryphal, but it's such a great apocryphal thing. Um, the idea that, that Palestrina was asked to write a mass that would impress the counter-reformation authorities as being pure enough so that music could be maintained um, in the church. And, uh, and he indeed 
uh, wrote this mass, which was a, a complete miracle, and then supposedly the cardinal said, oh, well, okay then. Um, but as, as you know, the Lutherans uh, believed very much in singing, but did not believe at first in having instruments um, in the church. Um, you, you referred to the instruments. Was there an equivalent to what later became the court music, that is music for dancing or entertainments? Oh, yeah. In there was, musical ensembles? Yeah, there's tons of great secular music, uh, music to dance to, uh, love songs. Uh, Josquin wrote uh, many, many chansons, he called them. And uh, do we have a, an example? Yeah. A sound file. Well, we're running out of time. Um, you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> um, well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you very much. <laughs>